Hi everyone. I am Dr. Shiv Shankar from India. This is the first episode of my brand new coffee break series. I have been practicing biomimetic dentistry for the past 10 to 12 years and through these short videos I'll be sharing the biomimetic protocols what I do in my day-to-day -day practice. At the beginning of my practice when I was constantly trying to upgrade myself I had an opportunity to interact with Manoj and Vijay from Vijay Dental Depot Chennai. It's through them I got introduced to Evoclar. When very limited resources and study materials were available in internet, I received regular updates in the form of magazines, special edition articles, materials and informations about new concept like BPS. I have been using Emacs for quite some time, for especially only for anteriors. But it was a great surprise for me when Manoj told me that Emacs can be used for posteriors. So I thought I should try this. And at that particular time, no labs were promoting Emacs as a restorative material for posteriors. As Manoj accepted to provide me the lab support from that training center, I prepared a posterior tooth 36, took a piece of paper, and drew something like this for shared communication, and sent my work to the training center. So this is what I received from the training center. A beautiful posterior Emax crown for 36. I was totally convinced with the material because of the precise fit, excellent aesthetics and superior strength and started incorporating Emax in my practice for posterior restorations. This is a 5 years follow up image after bonding and nothing has changed except for the mild gingival restriction. And this is how I started using Emacs for posterior restorations in my practice. Let's move on to biomimetic dentistry. Let's move on to biomimetic dentistry. I came across a lot of articles and videos about biomimetic dentistry for more than 12 years. But I would like to mention some articles and lectures which gave me a lot of confidence to incorporate biomimetic concepts in my practice. Among many lectures and videos by Dr. Pascal Magne, this one is very special to me. No post, no crown. As I have watched few lectures before this, more than the content of the lecture, I like the title. After this lecture, it was very easy for me to convince my patients. Patients liked my minimal, minimally invasive approach and this took my practice to the next level. Next, I would like to mention this article, Crown and Post-Free Adhesive Restorations for Endodontically Treated Posterior Teeth from Direct Composite to Endocrowns. One of the most discussed article for both positive and negative reasons. This is an image from that particular article regarding guidelines for full occlusal coverage where the author suggests that a butt joint can be placed. For the palatal cusp, we need 2-3 to three millimeter of occlusal reduction. On the contrary, for the buccal cusp, we have three options. The ultra-conservative buccal cusp coverage where the reduction is just 1.5 mm. The conventional buccal cusp coverage where we need to reduce 2-3 to three mm. Then the full buccal cusp coverage. The next image from the same article regarding the type of restorations for different situations. So for class 1 defect, Direct composite, composite restorations can be done without any cuspal coverage. For class 2, MO and OD, direct composite or indirect restorations can be done without any cuspal coverage. And the third image from the same article regarding the thickness of remaining wall after endo. The rule is to assess the thickness of the remaining wall and if it's more than 2 or 3 mm, we can retain that and proceed without a full cuspal coverage, maybe with an inlay, onlay, or a direct restoration. And the next image from the same article, a grossly decayed premolar restored with an onlay. After reading this article, I started restoring a lot of molars and premolars with inlays, onlays, and direct composites, considering the thickness of the remaining walls. Then a lecture by Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz about supragingival dentistry 
using indirect and direct composite inlays. Until this lecture, I was not very confident with my finished margins. But he convinced me that we don't need these kind of preparations anymore. For bonded border restorations, we just need simple preparation design. Dr. Ruiz shared few criteria regarding supragingival dentistry. First, careful removal of the old restoration or caries close to gingiva or pulp. If proper precautions are not followed, then in case of deep caries very close to pulp, it may lead to pulpal exposure. We don't need any retention or resistance form in the form of boxes. After occlusal reduction, make sure that your finish margin is slightly below the contact. In case of tooth, when healthy and intact, we don't need to remove the healthy tooth structure to open the contact. We can use metal strips to reshape the tooth and open the contact. And the third criteria is to preserve as much enamel as possible and try to place your margin on the enamel. In case of deep subgingival caries, if enamel is completely lost, elevate the margin using composite and you can place your margin on the composite. Then he suggests few protocols for inlay or onlay preparations. Make sure that you have rounded internal angles and no sharp line angles. Margins on enamel and preserve enamel. Make sure that you have an occlusal clearance minimum of 2 mm to provide sufficient thickness for your restorative material. Either it may be an Emax or a composite. If possible, keep porcelain under compression with simple preparation design. And then he presented a case with fractured cusp restored with a simple preparation design and a composite onlay. So these are some of the lectures and articles which made me realize that these kind of restorations are easily doable. In early part of my biometric practice, I have been using a lot of composites our regular composites for direct restorations and lab composites for indirect restorations. Then I realized that with Emacs as a restorative material along with biometric protocols, I have endless possibilities and you can check the list of restorative options I have with Emacs. Inlay, onlay, overlay, crowns, veneers, tabletops, veneer lay, chip ceramics, crown with post, Maryland Bridge and so on. Let me show you some cases which I have done with Emacs. Veneer lay. This is a combination of occlusal overlay and buccal veneer. This patient was to totally edentulous except for this po three posteriors and he was not willing for extraction. So I bonded veneer lay to premolar and first molar and overlay to the second molar and delivered upper upper denture and lower RPD. And now we can see the follow-up image which was taken one week back after eight years. Chip ceramic. These are the restorations I do once in a while. Impression taken, small pieces of ceramic fabricated in the model and bonded to the prepared tooth structure. We don't need extensive tooth preparation, we just need a slight bevel at the defective site. In case of grossly decayed tooth, where a post is required, instead of placing a separate post, sometimes I fabricate a crown with post using Emacs as a single unit, which can be bonded directly into the prepared post space. In case of missing anteriors, in favorable situations, Maryland Bridge is my restorative option. Very simple, minimally invasive and long-lasting solution. Can you identify the restored tooth after endo? One tooth was endo treated and in situations where I have an intact buccal surface, I prefer these kind of restorations. And most importantly, when occlusion is favorable without any deep bite. Deep subgingival caries, laser gingivectomy done to expose caries completely, undercut blocked using flowable composite, impression taken 
and a small piece of ceramic fabricated and bonded to the palatal defect. A case of severe attrition. As you can see, the lower anteriors are completely attrited and almost close to the pulp. These kind of asymptomatic cases can be treated even without root canals using tabletops and veneers. In this case, attrition of the lower anteriors were on the lingual side and the buccal surface was intact. So the veneers were bonded lingually and the posteriors were restored with tabletops. Coming back to the article which I mentioned earlier, I started restoring both molars and premolars based on the thickness of remaining walls. That is, when we have more than 2 to 3 mm of remaining wall, we can go ahead without a complete cuspal coverage. So in this situation, you can see a molar and premolar restored with an inlay. Another case, after endo, the tooth was restored with an onlay. So everything went fine. I was totally convinced with the concept and my patients were happy and exactly one year later, now it's the time to expect the unexpected. This patient came with a fractured palatal cusp, endotreated, tooth restored with an inlay and the case was almost similar to the tooth which I saw in the article. Image after removing the palatal cusp, the fracture was too deep and most at the bone level and I was sure that the thickness of remaining wall was definitely sufficient to restore the tooth with an inlay. Then I went back to the article and checked what went wrong. Now I noticed a line which I missed in my previous reading in safe occlusal context. So I thought this must be something related to the functional cusp and the fracture must be due to the stress on the palatal functional cusp. Within a week, next patient came. Now it's a fracture of the lingual cusp. Image was taken after modifying the fractured tooth for a crown. Few weeks later, another patient. Now it's the buccal cusp. Again, this tooth was modified for a crown. And one more, lingual cusp now. After seeing all these failures, now I was totally confused. I couldn't really understand what's meant by in safe occlusal context. Irrespective of the age, irrespective of the functional or non-functional cusp, with enough thickness of remaining walls, fracture occurred everywhere, buccal, palatal and lingual. But I was happy for one reason. Even in these worst failures, you can see my bonded Emacs sticking to somewhere on the other side of the tooth. And I have managed all these failures with the crown, even though the fracture was at the bone level. And one more failure. I am showing this for a different reason and you will be knowing why at the end of this lecture. A grossly decayed molar and premolar, endotreated. Patient was without a crown for several years with an amalgam filling. So now he came with a complaint of food impaction in 3-5 because of the dislodged amalgam restoration. I removed all the caries, sealed the dentin and prepared the tooth for an overlay. You can see the final restoration. This was in 2014. Then I met the patient in 2018 with debonded overlay. You can also observe a small piece of fractured tooth sticking to the overlay. Here is the buccal view and uh, you can see some healthy tooth structure which is left behind. And this was the only time I could save a premolar after failure as the situation was favorable with a sound rim of enamel to bond with ideal occlusal clearance. Since the tooth was fractured, I couldn't bond the same overlay again. I fabricated a new one and bonded again.
So I was disappointed when I started seeing follow-ups and a series of failures. The concept which I thought was a game changer in my practice suddenly has become a disaster. I started searching for solutions so that I can send my patients with trouble-free restorations. And I slowly realized that almost 99% of the failures were endotreated tooth which were restored with inlays and onlays. I never had any issues with overlays. So instead of having so many options for treating an endotreated tooth, I tried to simplify my protocols and limited my treatment options. So this is what I do and what I believe and sharing my protocols for restoring a tooth with an inlay, onlay or overlay. So let me classify the cavities into small, medium and large. First we will discuss about a situation, small cavity, vital tooth, both molars and premolars. Patient came with a complaint of cold sensitivity. We can see some secondary decay there. I remove the old restoration, seal the dentin and restore the tooth with ceramic inlay. So in case of vital tooth, small size cavities like this for both molars and premolars. I prefer a direct class 2 composite restoration or an indirect restoration and my material choice will be Emax for indirect restoration. Let's move on to medium size cavity. So medium size cavity, deep caries almost close to the pulp. Infected part of the tooth carefully removed, dentin was sealed with immediate dentin sealing and tooth restored with an onlay. So in such cases, vital tooth, medium size cavity for both molars and premolars, I prefer indirect restorations with Emax. For me, indirect restorations are stress-free, more predictable and time-saving in such wide defects. Then about large cavity. Large cavity, grossly decayed occlusal surface. Patient came with cold sensitivity. Caries excavated, weak unsupported tooth structure removed, immediate dentin sealing done and tooth restored with an overlay. So large cavity, vital tooth, both molar and premolars. Indirect restoration will be my option and Emax will be my material choice. So now let's move on to endotreated tooth, molars first. Small cavity, endotreated, based on the thickness of remaining walls, the tooth was restored with an inlay, which I have done few years back. Am I doing this now? No. Then medium size cavity, endotreated and restored with an onlay, few years back. Do I prefer this today? No. Case done few years back, large cavity, endotreated, tooth prepared for complete occlusal coverage and restored with overlay. Am I doing this now? I do. Irrespective of the size of the cavity, small, medium or large, complete cuspal coverage is my choice for molars especially after endo treatment and I don't prefer inlays or onlays anymore. This statement may look controversial but this is what I practice and these protocols were framed by me for me not after just completing 10 or 20 cases but after completing more than 1000 cases with several follow-ups and series of manageable and unmanageable failures. Now moving on to premolars. In case of small cavities like this, I may go for a class 2 direct restoration or a ceramic inlay. This tooth was restored with a ceramic inlay after endo. But as far as premolars are concerned, I prefer crowns and Emax will be my material choice. Nothing can be compared to the beauty of Emax. If you haven't, if you haven't tried Emax, then start with premolars 
and you have so many advantages precise fit excellent aesthetics and superior strength why i don't prefer inlays or onlays for premolars especially after endo treatment in case of this molar which i showed you before even in this worst scenario i was able to manage the failure with the crown as i had some intact tooth structure to restore but imagine a failure like this in premolars i haven't documented any premolar failures but almost every time they had to be extracted failures are hard to manage why i don't prefer overlays for premolars discoloration there is always a chance of tooth discoloration after endodontic treatment imagine this as a premolar especially in the smile zone although we may be conservative definitely our patients won't be happy when something happens like this tooth and the restoration in different shades even if the tooth doesn't discolor over a period of time there will be a demarcation seen at the junction between the tooth and the restoration because of the resin cement which again won't look nice when the patient smiles so this is how i started my biometric practice constantly updated myself through online lectures and articles encountered a lot of failures and framed some protocols for myself i am not suggesting you to follow this but just sharing what i do what i am confident with what i believe is a stress free and trouble free solution for me so let me summarize what we have discussed so far in this video guidelines for bonded posterior restorations so first no post no crown we don't need post and crown in certain ideal situations where the tooth can be restored with bonded restorations but it's hard to believe for someone who is new to this concept let me answer few common questions are they better than crown yes in certain situations i'll be discussing when and why bonded restorations in a different episode are they stronger than crowns once bonded to bonded to tooth s emax possesses high strength more than 400 megapascal with a combination of excellent flexural strength and high fracture toughness this is 2 years follow up of an overlay and the image was taken almost 3 years back still it's functioning in patient's mouth and even in this image you can you can't find any signs of failure with missing first molar just imagine the amount of stress and occlusal load this restored molar has to withstand so definitely they are stronger do they debond i have showed few failures and even in those worst scenarios you could see my inlay or onlay sticking to the other side of the tooth so with proper protocols definitely chances of debonding is very less always make sure that you have sufficient space for your restorative material doesn't matter if it's a composite or emax make sure you have at least 2 mm of occlusal clearance you don't need any complicated margin preparations we can just place a butt joint make sure that you have rounded internal angles i just follow the defect and you can see my prep just going smooth with rounded internal angles try try to preserve as much enamel as possible and place your margin on enamel in case of deep subgingival caries try to elevate margin and make it supragingival so the next important thing this was a failure of the premolar which i showed you never bond to decalcified tooth structure and this was the reason for this failure the decalcified tooth structure prevents formation of adequate seal as a result of this this part of the tooth is unable to withstand the shrinkage stress and as a result debonding occurs when bonding is not proper there will be ingress of bacteria as a result of micro leakage which leads to secondary caries along the leaking margins then i showed a case of double winged maryland bridge 
usually in such cases what happens is after one or two years either the mesial or the distal wing fractures and for the rest of the life the bridge just sticks to one side either the mesial or the distal side and the other wing remains useless this is 9 years follow up of a single winged maryland bridge 1 to bonded to 1 1 with a single winged emax so this is a simple and effective way of restoring upper and lower anteriors single tooth and now i prefer a single wing in these kind of situations so with that we come to the end of the presentation all my future videos will be published in my youtube channel biomtic center so subscribe my channel biomtic center for regular notifications join my facebook page biomtic center for regular updates and you can follow me on facebook in my name my next presentation will be on documentation which will be published few days later and this will be about how documentation can help you to upgrade your skill and practice so thanks for watching and until we meet next time it's bye from shiva